test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. Hear a conversation between a woman and the librarian. Now you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions 1 to 6. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to join the library. We're new to the district, you see. Hmm, certainly. Well, all we need is some sort of identification with your name and address on it. Oh dear. We just moved, you see, and everything has my old address. A uh, driving license, perhaps? No, I don't drive. No, your husband's would do. Yes, but his license will still have the old address on it. Hmm, perhaps you have a letter addressed to you at your new house. No, I'm afraid not. We've only been there a few days, you see, and no one's written to us yet. Well, what about your bank book? That's just the same. Oh dear, and I did want to get some books out this weekend. We're going on holiday to relax after the move, you see, and I wanted to take something with me to read. Well, I'm sorry, but we can't possibly issue tickets without some form of identification. What about your passport? What? Oh, yes, how silly of me. I've just got a new one, and it does have our new address. I've just been to book our air ticket, so I have it on me. Ah, well, that's all right. Your ticket will be ready soon. OK. Um, how many books am I allowed to take out? You can take four books out at a time, and you can also get two tickets to take out three magazines or periodicals. Newspapers, I'm afraid, can't be taken out. Oh, that's fine. Uh, do you have a record library? Some libraries do, I know. Yes, we do. You have to pay a deposit of $5 in case you damage them, but that entitles you to take out two records at a time. That's good. Could you show me where your history and biography sections are, please? Yes, just over there to your right. If there's any particular book you want, you can look it up in the catalogue, which you'll find just around the corner. You can also find a touchscreen information service on level two. Thank you. Oh, and how long am I allowed to keep the books for? Well, the normal loan period is three weeks, with two weeks extension. Oh, dear. We're going away for four weeks. Can I renew them now? I'm afraid not. You must do that at the end of three weeks. I see. Thank you very much. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions 7 to 10. Well, let's go into some details. Your name, please, madam. My name is Barbara. The surname is Cooper. It's spelt as C-O-O-P-E-R. Fine. And what's your contact number? If we have new books coming, we can contact you in time. Good. You can call me on 723-6518, but it's better after 5 p.m. You know I have to work during the daytime. Do you need the office number? I don't think so. It's enough. Could you tell me the address? I lived in King Road, but of course you need my new address. Um, it's 25 St. Mary Road, Hanwell. That's H-A-N-W-E-L-L. -L. Is that right? Yes. Do you need the passport number? I just brought it with me. Here you are. Yes, thank you. The number of your passport is G5798-0942. OK, and your ticket is ready. The number is M930123. Thank you. Could I take a look around and check out some books? Of course, as you like.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation about plans for a university sports centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Before we go on to look at specific sports, let's think for a moment about the non-sports facilities we really need here. Uh, things like better changing rooms and showers. Yes. If this really is going to be a state-of-the-art building, it'll need to have high-tech amenities, but mm. also places for people to chill out after all the exercise they've been doing. Somewhere they can meet up for a drink or whatever afterwards is essential in a place like this. But what else? Hmm. How about a sauna? Those who use them say it's the perfect way to relax after you've trained. The trouble is, though, that there's a debate going on about how safe they are. Some say it's risky to be exposed to all that heat before or after strenuous exercise, which of course is exactly when people in sports centres want to use them. There have also been problems with people overusing them to sweat off weight. So, to avoid any possible dangers, I don't think I'd include them on my list. Talking of dangers, I wonder whether we ought to have some sort of facility where minor injuries, like cuts and bruises and sprains, can be treated. Maybe. It would seem to make sense, with all the mishaps that are bound to occur when you have so many people running and jumping about and so on. Ah, hold on, though. Isn't the new medical centre going to be built right opposite? Yes, it is. It should be finished by the end of next year. <laughs> then there's no point, is there? Anyone who gets hurt can go over there, where there'll be much better treatment than anything mm. we could offer on site. Yes, I can see that. What we should provide, though, is a facility with full-time physiotherapists, for everybody on the campus, that is. As well as treating people, they could work on prevention of things like muscle tears and strains. Right. And something else the new place ought to have, also as a way of preventing injuries, is somewhere to test just how fit people are before they start lifting weights or running long distances and so on. Yes, I was going to suggest that. When I was at the Newport Centre, they put me on a static bike to check out my cardiovascular system. Ah. Then they worked out how much body fat I had. All of it valuable information telling you exactly what shape you're in. Another thing I've heard some universities do, especially some of the newer ones, is provide rooms and equipment for lectures to take place actually inside their sports centres. How do you feel about that? Well, as it happens, I've got first-hand experience of that too. We used to have some of our sports science lectures right next to the main sports hall, and I think it made what we were hearing about seem much more relevant to the real world. So, in that respect, I definitely think it's a good idea, yes. Mm, I can see that, though my own feeling is that we need to have more concrete reasons. Mm. The problem is that we won't have unlimited space, and somehow I don't think providing more lecture halls is going to be one of our priorities. So, I'd be against that one, I'm afraid. Anything else? Hmm. Well, just that I agree about the need to have a place where people can go for a chat and maybe have a coffee or a bite to eat together. That was something I always thought was one of the strong points of the centre in London. It was a great place to find out about new activities from the people who actually did them. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So what about the main sports facilities themselves? What do we need? Well, we don't need a rugby pitch because there's already one on the campus. Um, the same's true of table tennis, really. Hmm. Most of the halls of residence for students have their own tables, so there's no point in using precious space here for any more. Agreed. Something none of them have, though, is any sort of pool. A lot of students have complained about this, saying they have to take a bus downtown if they want to go for a swim. Yes, that's definitely one for this place. Perhaps a jacuzzi, too. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would. Perhaps next to the squash courts, just down there to the right. They are very popular, by the way. I think we should have a couple more here, don't you? Absolutely. And another sport that's been growing in popularity is volleyball, especially since we did so well at the last Olympics. Uh, don't you mean basketball? <laughs> yes, I do. Sorry. Anyway, the point is that there is a court in the old gym next to the Students' Union building, but it always seems to be fully booked up, even though it's not very good. And there's nowhere else on campus to play. OK, let's have one of those too. How much space have we got left, by the way? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about America in the 1960s. You have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. We begin our examination of America in the 1960s with the usual caution. There is no sense in trying to understand any decade without looking at what came before. Those of you who still have outstanding coursework on the 1950s would do well to complete it now, if for no other reason, then it will help make sense of the next series of lectures. But we must press on, and I'd like to begin my talk about the 60s with a reference to one of those things that came before, the post-war baby boom. With the end of the Second World War in 1945, there began in the USA an era of perceived prosperity and security. In short, people started to feel that the world was a much better and safer place to bring up children. So, at the start of the 60s, all those children born in the baby boom, 70 million in the U.S. alone, were teenagers. As the 60s progressed, and as this large number of people approached adulthood, there was a noticeable shift in the balance of power and young people began to have a voice in ways that were not considered possible in the more conservative atmosphere of the preceding decade. Things were moving forward at a rapid pace. The literature of the time brought out all the taboos. Everything was covered, such as race in, for example, the book To Kill a Mockingbird, the role of women changed, and uh, equality for women, well, let's just say that once certain books were published, women were no longer going to be satisfied with their roles as devoted wives and mothers. Through literature alone, the whole fabric of society was challenged, and by the end of the 60s, 
things would never again be as they had pretty much been for the preceding 40 years. It was a decade of protest, civil rights protests, feminism, the rights of minorities, the Vietnam War. All these causes led to peaceful and not-so-peaceful protests on college campuses and elsewhere. People had been given freedom of speech and they were going to use it. The crime rate rose to nine times what it was in the 50s, as respect for the old order faded away. But it was also a time of great development. In medicine, the 60s saw the first heart transplant. In technology and the space race, where we saw the first American in orbit and lasers being invented at the start of the decade, and the first man on the moon, and the first primitive internet at the end. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. None of this, good or bad, might have happened if things in 1962 had gone slightly differently. On October 16th, President John F. Kennedy met with his closest advisors at the White House. They had obtained photographic evidence showing that Cuba was building or installing nuclear weapons. It was widely believed that Cuba was preparing to fire these weapons at cities in the USA. Kennedy was faced with three choices. To try to resolve the crisis diplomatically by negotiating with Cuba and the Soviet Union. To take action to block the delivery of more weapons into Cuba. Or to attack Cuba, destroying their weapons. Believing that the first option would end in failure and that the third option would lead to war, it was the second option that Kennedy chose. In doing so, he succeeded in preventing the buildup of more missiles. The Soviet Union then withdrew the weapons from Cuba. Most historians agree that if Kennedy had acted differently, the episode would have led to a full-scale nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Millions would have died, and the world would have been changed beyond recognition. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear the first part of a lecture on American culture and American customs. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, last week we talked about American education, and today I'm going to discuss American values, characteristics, personal habits and courtesies. Keep in mind as you are listening to this lecture that your goal is to understand, not to emulate or judge. 
Just briefly, I'd like to mention that there is a remarkable ethnic diversity in the United States. The population of the USA is about 260 million. 73% of the American population is white. 12% is African American. 8% Hispanic. 3% Asian or Pacific Islanders. And less than 1% American Indian or Eskimo. Many Americans resent generalizations being made about them because Americans see themselves as very unique and individualistic. On the other hand, Americans tend to lump foreigners together into one lot and condescendingly view foreigners as people who are not as intelligent or sensible as Americans. Despite Americans' dislike of generalizations and their ethnocentric point of view, it becomes evident that they are indeed American. Americans value individualism, independence, informality, directness, punctuality, achievement and competition. Individualism is probably the most highly esteemed value in the American culture and an important key to understanding American behaviour. In the historical development of the country, individuality was crucial for survival. If you asked Americans to characterise the ideal person, they would probably use adjectives such as autonomous, independent and self-reliant. Persons tend to be viewed as individuals rather than as representatives of a family or a group. Here are some examples of how this value affects behaviours. 1. If a group of friends go to a restaurant, everyone wants to pay their own way. In other words, they want to have separate checks and not be someone's guest. 2. In friendships, which seem to initially develop more quickly in the US than in other cultures, the Americans may feel uncomfortable if you give them more help than they need. This is a tendency to draw back and see dependency as weakness. In some ways, the stress on the individual rather than the family or group has led to a more informal society. Sometimes this lack of formality is viewed by members of other cultures as a sign of lack of respect. But that is not the intention in the American value system. This informality is even more predominant on the university campus than in other segments of society. Some ways in which you might see this value expressed in behaviours are 1. You will generally be on a first-name basis with other students, in spite of any age differences. 2. Dress is very informal on campus. 3. Language is informal and sometimes confusing. Phrases like, see you later, and drop by any time, are not meant literally. They are informal ways of saying goodbye. Americans are direct. Honesty and frankness are more important to Americans than saving face. They may bring up impolite conversation topics which you may find embarrassing, too controversial or even offensive. Americans are quick to get to the point and do not spend much time on formal social amenities. This directness encourages Americans to talk over disagreements and to try to patch up misunderstandings themselves rather than ask a third party to mediate disputes. It is particularly interesting to see what behaviours have culturally become associated with straightforwardness. 1. A firm handshake somehow has come to be interpreted as a sign of sincerity. 2. Looking at a person when you speak to him or her gives an indication of honesty. 3. In a question of honesty versus politeness, honesty wins. It is considered better to refuse graciously than to accept an invitation and not go. 4. You will be taken at your word. If you refuse food the first time it is offered, to be polite, it may not be offered again. An American will not know that your initial refusal is politeness. Great value is attached to time in the US. Punctuality is considered an important attribute. As with all values, 
There are different rules of acceptability in different cultures. In the US, you should be present for school or business appointments at the exact time agreed upon. In social appointments, you can arrive 10 to 15 minutes after the agreed upon time without giving offence. If you are invited somewhere for dinner and are more than 15 minutes late, you will need to offer an apology and an explanation. A phone call explaining you have been detained and will be late will save face for you and patience for the other person. Americans also value achievement and competition. The American style of friendly joking or banter, of getting the last word in, and the quick and witty reply, are subtle forms of competition. Although such behaviour is natural to Americans, you may find it overbearing or disagreeable. Americans are obsessed with records of achievement in sports, and sports awards are often displayed in their homes. Also, sometimes books and movies are judged not so much on quality, but on how many copies are sold, or on how many dollars of profit are realised. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.